Okay. <clears throat> so for the last two lectures, we defined the four steps of the, of the statistical process. So the first is identify a question or problem. Two is collect relevant data. on the topic. Three is analyze said data. And four is draw a conclusion. So today, it's another kind of purge a bunch of the common terms and statistics sort of lectures. Um, we are going to be talking about terminologies for this third one, analyzing the data. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about graphs that we're going to see coming up. And I'm going to give us an example of a scatter plot and how to draw a scatter plot. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and we're going to talk about relationships between variables. So that's what's on the agenda for today. Data basics is the name of this section. So to motivate this conversation, let's start by looking at some data. I think it is, I want the emails one, this one. Yes, this is the right one. So this is what we'd call a data matrix. And I think I mentioned last live lecture that this is often what I think about whenever I think about data, which is kind of sad. I wish I thought of something more exciting than a data matrix, but it is indeed the case. <clears throat> so I'm going to explicitly define the different parts of this, but just to give you a general description of what this data is, these are 50 emails on <clears throat> where the rows correspond to the different emails and the columns correspond to different qualities about those emails. And to put that explicitly, each row in this matrix is a single email. and a general we call these observations or cases so pretty straightforward each instance of something in a data matrix we refer to as an observation or a case. Um, <clears throat> these are great examples of things that, um, just for future reference, that I may not necessarily test you on, but it's certainly important for us to explicitly talk about now because it's going to be in the vernacular. I'm going to refer to these terms and expect you to know what I mean whenever I say an observation, right? I'm referring to the rows in a data matrix or a single instance of our data. Each column, to give us the terminology for this part, represents a characteristic of the emails. Ooh. Which we will call variables. Again, when I refer to a variable, I'm referring to a quality of interest with the different instances in our data, with the different observations in our data set. So in this case, spam is an example of one of our variables. I don't know why I erased that, just redraw it. 
and it classifies each of the emails as being yes, it was spam or no, it was not. <clears throat> um, so just to read this off, I think you all, <laughs> at least if your facial expressions say anything, you all seem to get it. But <laughs> the first email to just read how I would read this data set is that the first email was not spam. It, cre it contained 21,705 characters. It had 551 line breaks. It was in the HTML format. And I believe the number refers to if there were as a number in it. And indeed, there was, and it was a small number. All right? So data matrices are something that we will see in the future. And you should at least know kind of how they are formatted and how we refer to the different parts of it. Of them. Okay. Variables, or the columns in our data matrix, come in two types. First is categorical. These take category or label values and place an observation into one of several groups. So an example from our emails that have a categorical variable <laughs> is actually spam, which we talked about earlier. There are two groups. Yes, it is spam. No, it is not spam. And this variable categorizes each variable as being a member of one of those two groups. Yes, spam, no spam. There is a subcategory of, of categorical variables called ordinal, uh, called ordinal. And this is when some sort of order is associated with the category labels. So <clears throat> I guess you could argue whether or not this one is truly an ordinal variable. But for the ex in the example, if you had something that's like big, medium, small, so here we have, I guess, none, small, and big for our number variable, or like um, <clears throat> group one, two, three, or four, level one, two, three, or four. These are categories, yes, but they're categories that do have some sort of order associated with them. Um, <laughs> cold, tepid, hot, maybe. <laughs> um, we're not going to do a whole lot with classifying ordinal variables. I bring it up because I think some of your homework assignments might refer to them, and I just want you to know what they mean when they say that. The second type of variable. Oh, my goodness. Just love it when this iPad bugs out on me. Our numerical. So numerical variables take quantitative values and represent some kind of measurement. So a good example of this would be the number of characters. 
This variable quantifies how many characters were in a given email. And it is certainly a number, and that number represents an amount of something associated with that variable. So we would call this a numeric variable. Uh, question for the class. What kind of variable is line breaks? Numerical. Boom. <laughs> Correct. What kind of variable is format? Categorical. Very nice. All right. Thank you. This is, again, this stuff is straightforward. This is very intentionally just a purge of terminology so we can start jumping into the math of statistics. So those are our two types of variables. What I have for us next is actually something I garnered from um, the emails you all sent me. We have our first shout out to somebody in this class. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's not particularly exciting, but um, we're going to talk about scatter plot. And I'm going to show us how to draw a scatter plot using data that I found from datausa.io, which is actually a pretty interesting portal if any of you ever want to check it out. And it is this one right here. So we have a number of people from Raleigh, North Carolina. So I went on to Google and I looked up what sort of data can I find about Raleigh? And I don't know if I'm representing Raleigh quite well, but I did find a bunch of their, um, <clears throat> for the years 216 through 218, their average yearly wages for different occupations in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I just printed out the first part of this data set. Um, so I have three occupations that we're looking at, uh, retail, um, teachers, and truck drivers, which for whatever reason, these are the ones that were reported in the data set. And the average um, yearly wages of people in those, um, in those categories who'd identified as male or female. So we have two numeric variables here. For, in this case, we just have three observations. And a scatter plot is a graph that we use to visualize the relationship between two numeric variables. So, And I'm going to show you um, how to draw one. Although I hope many of you have seen a scatter plot before. So on the x axis, I'm going to put average female wage. on the y average male wage. Looks like it goes from 30K, 35, 40K, 45K. And what you do is for every observation in your data matrix, a single point on the scatter plot is going to correspond to a single observation in the matrix. So let's look at this first observation, retail salespersons. It would seem the meal, ma mean male wage was 
47, uh, around 47K, and mean, fem mean female wage was around 33K. So down here, I would look at, okay, uh, 33K is about here, 47 is about here. So that observation would get that point on the graph, right? Um, for elementary and middle school teachers, um, it looks like the male is 47, over 47K, and the female is 43K. So 43K and then above 47, they're gonna be about right here. And the last one, truck drivers, um, female is at 33 and male is at 41. So once you've drawn this, <clears throat> there are a number of things we can say about the graph. The first of which, and I will leave you to kind of think about this, is this line, the line y equal x, is the place where the y, the y values above this line, the y values are gonna be greater than the x values. And below this line will be the other way around. X values are greater than the Y values. So the fact that all of these points show up above this line means that um, Raleigh, North Carolina is not remarkable in this regard that the average male wage for all of these occupations is higher than the average female wage is during the years 2016 to 2018 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, <clears throat> this is a worthwhile observation. You know, our visualization allowed us to see this immediately from just looking at the graph. But I'm going to talk a little bit less about this y equals x line. And I'm a little bit more interested in describing the shape of the points on a scatter plot. So this was my uh, little example of, um, of how to draw a scatter plot. I'm now going to post a little bit bigger of one because I think it's easier to talk about when there are actually more points. So we're going to be looking at this data, which are every single observation of this data are counties in the United States. And we have a lot of information about every single county. We have what state they're from right here. We have the population in that county, et cetera, et cetera. And the two I want us to look at are the percentage of home ownership which is what percentage of people in that county actually own their home. And percentage um, of people in multi-unit homes. So that is percentage of people whose living situation is in a multi-unit. So like they have an apartment in a multi-unit structure or something along those lines. <clears throat> and we're going to look, I've already made this scatter plot for us, or rather somebody else made it and I took it. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and it looks something like this. So again, every single point on the scatter plot is an observation from our data matrix. And this, this plot allows us to visualize how the variable multi percent of multi um, units and multi unit structures, so percent of people who are in multi unit structures in this county, um, how that variable relates to the percentage of home ownership. And there's a number of things we can say. What I want us to notice, and what I'm going to try to define more precisely in a second, is that there seems to be a downward trend. If I were to kind of like approximately draw a line to this data, I would notice that the line, it might be a little linear, but it's going downward. What that means is as percentage of units and multi-unit structures increases, percentage of home ownership decreases. So I'm actually going to, I'm going to write an equivalent statement to that explicitly, and then we're going to talk about how we interpret scatter plots a little bit more. So I would say, um, based on this data, We would expect a county with a higher
percentage of units. to have a lower percentage of home ownership. <clears throat> so these are the ideas when doing a scatter plot. Any questions about this? I need to stop for questions more often, but it does seem like you all are just writing this down. So maybe I should take that as a good sign. Um, I want us to take a step back for a second, and I'm going to define um, three ideas that we want to think about whenever we look at scatter plots. Um, for your statement, could you also do it like the other way, like if a county with a lower um, number of units to have a higher percentage of ownership? Exactly. They are equivalent. That's actually an excellent observation. That that is an equivalent way of saying that statement. Very good. So, <clears throat> when we think about the association between two variables. There are three big ideas. One, form. And that is actually what I did on our scatter plot for before. Can we draw a straight line to the data? Can we draw a curved line? What kind of curve? <clears throat> the next is direction. Of the association. If there is an association. We think about this in terms of positive, or we think about direction in terms of positive or negative. And three, strength. Which is how well can we predict the value of one variable with another? All right. So going back to our scatter plot example, Oop. well, looks like I'm zooming in. I would say the form of this is linear. It looks like I can draw a straight line to the to the relationship. I would say the direction, this is what we would call a negative association, a negative direction. 
And actually the reason for that being is it's going from left to right, it's going down, which is a negative slope. If you remember your algebra, which I hope you do. <laughs> so we call this negatively associated, negative linearly associated, because it's a line that we can draw. And this strength, I would say, looks kind of moderate. And I will actually give us a little bit more about strength. Let's do, let's see how well I can drop points on a scatter plot with this crappy stylus. So this we would say weak or even no association. I would call this moderate. And I would call this strong. So in our example, this is probably, I guess, and I'm basing this simply off of my own experience in this field, I would call this a moderate to strong association. This is actually a pretty good one. Some of them are much worse. <laughs> um, okay, so these are the three ideas when we talk about associations. Okay, I'm going to post a photo. Here are a bunch of different associations. And we are going to try to classify them in terms of our three ideas of understanding associations. And I am going to do it using this crappy polling feature on Zoom because I haven't figured out poll ever, anywhere yet. Um, let me see if it's going to work for me. Aha. All right. I think I made it active. Is it working? Ah, now it's active. We see it? Okay, awesome. <laughs> I'll leave that like that. So we're thinking about um, form, direction, and strength. So strength is moderate, form is linear. Um, direction is positive. So which one of these would fit that bill? Can you give us like 20 more seconds? All right. End this poll and share results. Again, I cannot actually see the results for some strange reason. So can somebody tell me how we did? 93% um, E and 3% each C and A. Nice. So the answer is E. Very good. <clears throat> C and A do seem to have kind of a positive. But the thing about C and A is that these aren't really linear relationships. This one looks like, I don't know, like a kind of like an exponential is what I would probably call that. And this is what we would call a quadratic. But we're actually not, <laughs> here's a hint for future polls. We're not going to do a lot with nonlinear associations in this class. We're going to mostly be focusing on how to talk about linear associations. Um, so the best answer here was indeed E. So very, very good job, everyone. All right. And I have one more, one more poll. Um, this one. All right, let me see if I can launch it. Okay, it has been launched. Which graphs show no association? And now I'm, I'm going to be very clear here. By that, by that I mean, for which graphs does knowing the x variable tell you nothing about the y variable? And you should be able to answer multiple things for this one, if there are multiple. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> All 
All right, can you give it about 10 more seconds? <laughs> Okay, sharing the results. Can somebody tell me what the breakdown is? Um, Tempered or 100% said F, and D had 21%, and then B had 46%. 46%. So F is very good. Good job, everyone. This one is very obviously no association. D, I would still call this association, it's just not a linear association. And a bunch of you got the very nuanced one, which is B. So this one, I wouldn't actually say there's much of an association. And the reason is because knowing if, if the X variable here is really big or really, really small or very big doesn't really tell me much about what's going on with the Y variable, right? If you think about it, me saying um, B being low, I, for, for like a, for like a positive relationship, I would like to say a sentence like, X variable being small means Y variable is small, X variable big means Y variable is big. That's a positive relationship. Um, and then negative is sort of like the flip of that. Whereas I can't really say either of these things in this case. If X variable is small, Y could be big or small. If X variable is big, Y could be big or small. So this is, this is sort of the tricky version. And actually, if we were to zoom in on this data, so like make the y-axis um, rescale and zoom in on it, um, it would probably look a lot more like F to us. So very nice catch, all of you people who caught that one. OK, let's get rid of that poll. Um, having like a weak association and, uh, or sorry, like a weak strength and then like a no association, is that the same like graph? <laughs> That's a great question. So, um, I would say that there's a little bit more of a nuance between weak and no association. The problem, um, and in fact, you're, you're bringing up an excellent point. The problem is that we're describing these things subjectively. Um, we're kind of just looking at them and saying, mm, this kind of falls into our, an idea of what a weak idea is and what a strong association idea is. And, you know, there are gray areas when it comes to subjective reasoning. So in this example, I was trying to make these points so it looked like they kind of went up to give you an example of weak. But sure, if, if you know, there was just one more point here, all of a sudden that looks very much like a no association. So the answer to your question is, well, it gets down to your understanding of it and your comprehension of it. Um, I will say though, a lot of this conversation is to motivate what we are going to do, which is quantifying relationships. Instead of looking at the data, can we do a calculation that spits out a number that tells us exactly how associated those two variables are? And that's um, what we call correlation, and it is absolutely something we're doing in the next few lectures. So thank you, actually. That, that brings up an excellent point about this topic. OK, let's see. I think we did. Yes, we did that one. I am going to now talk about these. OK, very nice. Good job, everyone. Okay, so now I'm going to do some other basic definitions we have to get out of the way. Okay, doke. <clears throat> so, I want to motivate this topic with a question. What if before we even picked up all that data on the different counties, we had this question? Does the percentage
of units and multi-unit structures. in a county, tell us anything about the percentage of home ownership. in that county. So this actually gets back to what we were saying earlier, this statement I made about the data. In fact, I'm gonna, why not? Let's copy it. The response to this question would be this. Based on the data, we did see a relationship between them, right? The distinction though is based on this research question, I'm asking specifically how one variable affects another variable. There is a one-way direction implicit to this question. And that's where we get the idea of explanatory and response variables. So an explanatory, In this case, um, is, excuse me, is percent of units in multi-unit in multi -unit housing. And the response, is the percent of home ownership. So by convention, the explanatory variable is the one that we put on the x-axis. So it is one on the horizontal axis of our scatter plot. And we generally put by convention, the response on the y-axis. <clears throat> now note the, the terminology we use here, explanatory and response. The percent of units in multi view housing is the variable that explains the changes in, the, um, in percent of home ownership. And percent ownership is a variable that responds to changes in percent of multi unit housing. So if you think about the terms, it is kind of describing this relationship that our research question is trying to get to. Oh, I have a question for the class. What kind of study is this? Can anyone tell me? Observational. Bingo! <laughs> You're very right. We didn't impose any treatment, like in the case of our stents. This is actually something that we had a question we collected all of the data without changing anything going on in the counties, and we just observed what was going on. Very nice. Okay. So one last topic, and I think we're gonna go to our quiz then. Any questions up until now? I think in the case of explanatory in response, um, somebody brought up in last class, um, if you ever experienced anything in statistics before, sometimes they also refer to these as independent and dependent variables. Um, we are choosing to go with this terminology because I don't want to confuse us with ideas of independence and dependence, which is something that we're going to touch upon a lot when we get to probability.
Cool. <clears throat> so. Whenever we look, at relationships, between two variables, like we did with our scatter plot. We must take care to consider possible confounding variables. And guess what? We have a definition. I wonder what it is. <laughs> Confounding variables. <laughs> our variables, of course, that are related. And in this class, um, a synonym for related that we're going to talk about is correlated to both the explanatory and response variables. So one of the quintessential examples of something like this is, oh, here, I'll even write it down. I have an example of this. Um, <clears throat> a study showed strong, so what is that? That's the strength, right? <laughs> Took me a second, I was like, strength. <laughs> um, strong, positive, the direction. Linear, the form. Association. Between sunscreen usage and skin cancer. Occurrences. So tell me, and you can just thumbs up or thumbs down. Does this mean that sunscreen, if you use more sunscreen, you're more likely to Cancer. Yeah? Very good. I think, oh my goodness. You're all too good at this. <laughs> um, yes, so um, <clears throat> the reason, uh, just because two variables have an association or correlation, doesn't actually mean that they cause one another. And I think, um, Many people, even if they have a peripheral understanding or experience with the field of statistics, they may have heard um, this sentence. Correlation does not equal causation. So when we do observational studies and we see a correlation between two variables, that may, you know, it may mean that those two, that a change in one of the variables is causing an effect in another variable. That could be true. 
or it could be true that they are both related to some other phenomenon that is causing a change in both of them. So in the case of our um, in the case of our sunscreen example, perhaps people who are using more sunscreen are also the people who happen to spend a lot more time in the sun. So really, the fact that they're spending so much time in sunlight is the reason that they're having more chance of skin cancer, rather than actually their usage of sunscreen. And in fact, sunscreen might even be working toward in the opposite direction, which is frankly what I would hope sunscreen is doing. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it seems a superfluous purchase. Um, we cannot say that one variable is causing the change in another variable. We can say something about the correlation between them, though. Correlation is a mathematical concept. Causation is like a is a scientific concept. <clears throat> I will say though, in this class, the one instance where we can say something about causation, or I guess the case where we are trying to get at causation explicitly, is when we're not doing observational studies, but experimental studies. So let's see if my iPad stops bugging so I can post this photo. So an example of this is our stents data. This was our example of an experimental study, right? <clears throat> we, um, we had a new technology, the stent that we applied or gave the implant to a bunch of patients who volunteered. Um, and then we followed a bunch of other patients with hopefully similar backgrounds and tried to see if there was a difference between these two groups. Now, when we have this thing, a control group, the reasoning behind a control group is that any confounding variables that affect the treatment group should also affect the control group. So in this case, we are able to get at causation with a reasonable amount of approximation and using statistical tools that we are going to cover in the future. But that is the idea here. Um, experimental studies in which there is a treatment and control are specifically trying, the thing they're trying to control for are these confounding variables that we aren't controlling for when we just do an observational study. Okay. Um, let me do a one through. I think that was all of the definitions I wanted to get through today. Um, yeah, that one's done. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Are there any questions up until now? Okay, so the next thing we have going for us is our quiz. I am going to, I think it's not scheduled to go up for another five minutes, but I can go ahead and make it active now. And I'm gonna stay on with all of this. Here, let me go ahead and stop recording.